In early December 1970, I received my second phone bill for my private phone line. Let's just get this over with quickly because, as you can imagine, things were still not right. First of all, I had 62 additional message units. This was way too many given the number of calls that I actually completed to my friends. But I couldn't do anything about that high number because the telephone company had just gotten through checking out the equipment that records the message units and they found nothing wrong. So I was just going to have to pay that part of the bill. Now as to the long distance calls, wouldn't you know it, there were once again several mystery calls to Harvey, Illinois on my bill. Each one was one minute, no telephone number listed. And there were also several of those no number charges to Beacon, New York. On these, I was able to call the business office and get them taken off the bill. Clearly something was amiss here, and I still didn't know what it was. But at least I wouldn't have to pay for those mystery long distance calls that didn't even show a phone number. Now, as to the party lines, it became clear to me that it was time for me to start using a nickname. I had been going by the name Evan, which was my real name at the time. I'm not sure what made me change my mind about this, but perhaps it was the fact that first, so many people were using nicknames, and Fred had just given out my number to everyone. Now, in the last days of 311, there had been a nickname that I heard a guy using, which I thought was just the greatest. He called himself The Bell. And there was something about that nickname that just kind of resonated with me. It rang true. I mean, it just had all the right overtone. Well, anyway, I liked the name. But that name was taken. However, I realized I could use a very similar name that wasn't taken. I could call myself The Doorbell. And one good thing about that name was that The Doorbell is associated with a particular sound that I could work into my new ID loops. I was, after all, going to have to replace this thing. Evan. Evan. Goodness, I think the recreation we made of that is more cringeworthy than the original. But anyway, that had to be replaced. And I thought that I could use my home doorbell as a sound effect in my musical IDs. There had, after all, been a company that had made the sound of a doorbell iconic. Avon calling. Well, I've got a doorbell too, so... Express yourself. Let's press the button and see how it sounds. Oh boy, you're kidding. Dong ding? Sounds like one of those Chinese dishes that you would have to be extremely adventurous to try. Well, let me try holding down the button for longer. You know, it's actually even worse than I thought. It's Dong Dink. And you don't really want to hear the back doorbell. How's that again? For as long as I could remember, my front doorbell had gone, and I never thought about it until now. Meanwhile, the sound produced by pressing the back doorbell button was so pitiful that we couldn't hear it. So my mom had put a note on the back door that said, Bell broken, please knock. Because there was no way we would hear that. How did this happen? I'm not sure, but I think somebody painted the wall behind the chimes. And let's just say those two painters who I'll call Tweedledee and Tweedledum didn't take the trouble to make sure they had hung ding and dong in the right places. And a byproduct of that was that the high chime in the low chime's place had been positioned so that the solenoid would come to rest against it, hence... Dink. But this was all speculation on my part because there was a huge wooden cabinet that had been custom built to go from wall to wall and ceiling to floor in front of the chimes. It seemed way too heavy to even move, so there was going to have to be a workaround. Now the whole idea of using a looping musical phrase is something I got from shortwave radio. Shortwave radio was my intense interest immediately prior to getting into phones in the middle of 1970. On shortwave, when the station is going to sign on, it will usually play something like this a few minutes before the program starts, 
so as to help its listeners tune in. Come in. Oh wait, that's... this is shortwave. That sounds like a back doorbell though, doesn't it? That's an actual good back doorbell sound. But anyway, this is a shortwave station about to sign on. Radio Sweden, Stockholm. Radio Sweden, Stockholm. You get the idea, and that is called an interval signal. Most of them were just a musical phrase being repeated without voice. Some, however, didn't use music. For example, here's the way most broadcasts from Italy began. Once in 1973, I caught that same agency in Italy doing this. Attenzione Montreal. Attenzione Toronto. Qui è la RAI, Radio Televisione Italiana. Qui è Roma che si collega con il Canada stazioni radio con programmi in italiano per un notiziario speciale. Qui è Roma. Italiani di Montreal e di Toronto state ascoltando la voce dell'Italia. Shortwave surely could be a wacky world. But anyway, in summer camp, the previous summer, I had for some reason made up a simple little tune, and what I had it in mind for was for use as an interval signal, should I ever need one. The funny thing was, I had never seen any reason to need an interval signal. I had seen some so-called party lines, but this was before we ever heard anyone using an amplifier, or even had the idea. Nonetheless, I composed this simple little tune, which was based on things I heard on shortwave. Specifically, this clock from the shortwave station in Lisbon, Portugal. And this music box interval signal from Switzerland. Once I got back home and we heard Herbie using an amplifier, got the idea that we wanted to do it, and even have a theme song. I somehow forgot about my tune, and instead just copied the tune of the interval signal of Radio Denmark. But now, it was time for a change, so I decided to use my tune this time, and the first thing to do was to replace the existing loop. Shut up! Now this time, instead of using the stereo tape recorder to double my voice like this, Evan, I'm going to use my reverb unit. Doorbell. There, that's different. And by the way, my reverb unit is made by the Steinway Piano Company. It's actually my mom's baby grand piano with the damper pedal held open. You put a microphone in the piano and shout into the strings, and with the damper pedal open, you get reverb. Doorbell. 
Now just add my tune, and here's loop number one. I ended up using that a lot through 1971. For the second loop, I played the tune on tuned water glasses, recorded that on tape, then played the tape through the piano strings, again to create reverb, and recorded the result, which was this. I never really liked that one, but I was happy to have created something that was played on a mystery instrument. You couldn't tell what it was. For loop number three, I decided to do a takeoff on this. Avon calling. Which would require getting my dysfunctional doorbell to cooperate. The solution turned out to be to press the button and hold it in for a long time, like this. Notice the solenoid hum is still audible. And now release and repress. Finally! Oh boy. Well, the point is, in there was a usable doorbell sound effect. Apparently, holding the solenoid in for a long time caused it not to come to rest against the high chime. So I did get a decent ding in there. Doorbell calling. Not too bad. Now, what musical instrument is this? Can you guess? Obviously, an exotic mandolin-like instrument from Yakistan. No. But if you slow it down... There, it's piano notes. My mom's open reel tape recorder had three speeds. And that made for some fun sound modification experiments. That one technique alone figured greatly into a number of different jingles that I ended up making through 1971. Another technique was to sing in falsetto voice and speed it up to create a whistle effect. I couldn't really whistle. Combining the two techniques, And then, of course, there was speeded voice that just sounded like speeded voice. Okay, that's kind of silly, but I am a big fan of this one. The fourth ID loop included the doorbell sound, coaxed out of my home doorbell, but did not include my tune. It was this. The actual hum of the solenoid of my home doorbell is audible there right before the ding, not during the ding, but it returns during the dong, which is the opposite way that a doorbell is supposed to work. So there it is. And by the way, the reason I include this stuff is because it had an impact on the way I perceive sound, and also people ask me about the name. I didn't use the moniker Evan Doorbell, putting the two names together, until I met the phone freaks. So the doorbell was my party line name. Evan Doorbell was my phone freak name. Of course, once I had a synthesizer in the middle of 1972, I could do stuff like this. From the 516 MDA, this is Evan Doorbell. So the name change and the ID loops were ready to go. I also made matching jingles for Neil, who was going to call himself The Rebel but we weren't going to make the transition to the new name and the new tune until 1971. In the meantime, there was that party line, the old 78062, which I had a hand in re-establishing, though not founding originally. You have reached a non-working number at the Department of Social Services. It stayed busy with old Long Island 311 people until approximately December 21st. On that fateful day, 
everyone who called the party line got this. Now, at first glance, you might think that this is just a busy signal, which means that someone is on this particular number and it's time to dial a different number in the same group. So, 6212 is busy, let's try another number, right? Wrong. Because there's a disturbing detail that I wanted to pretend wasn't there, but I did hear it. Let's run the tape back. Did we just ring into a busy signal? First audible in the background, but then audible at full volume after the ring in? I'm afraid so. That means the number we dialed was not busy. In fact, we have reached the party line. It's just that the party line now has become this. The sound of a busy signal. We rang into it. We're connected to it. It's just that this is what it is now. Ugh. Not good. This is like something that happened earlier this year. Remember when this was going on? The only difference between now and then is the tone used to make a noise on a party line that can no longer be talked through. It used to be this, now it's this, and no sound gets through it, not even my amplifier. So now I've got a decision to make. Do I want to go ahead and publicize this? No, not yet. Not yet. Because there's something I've been thinking about that I want to see if I can do. I've been wondering if there is one of these sub-exchanges in our Long Island 516 area code. So far, every one of these that we have found is in New York City. If I have to, I'll publicize Holland America, or maybe the 2704s, which is Brooklyn Cumberland Medical Center. But first, let's see if there's one of these in Nassau County, where I live. We wouldn't have to dial area code 212. Well, right off the bat, I do see an encouraging sign here because there's an office code, 391, which is listed in the directory as no charge. And listen to the sound we get calling a 391 number. Did those clicks sound familiar? Of course they did. We hear those calling the sub-exchanges that tend to have party lines in them. But this ringtone is like something from the regular part of the phone network. And I have to say, this specific one sounds very familiar. Where have I heard this? Where's the number you're calling from? Mm-hmm, I think so. Anyway, this 391 code is no charge, which I think means it's a phone company exchange. Now, in New York City, there's a no charge 396 code, and it does have a recording.
please dial 396-5100 for assistance. So these free phone company exchanges beginning with 39 can have recordings. The question is, does 391 have a recording that we could use as a party line? Well, here is a non-working number in Nassau County's 391, called from the Laurelton 5 Exchange in Queens. Three nine one three six two five. Thank you. Hold on. That number has been changed to two nine four three eight nine two. Thank you. Yeah, oh well, three nine one made some promising noises. But the vacant numbers are handled by operators, and that probably can't become a party line. But before I leave the subject, let me show you something really weird about 391. Now, when you make a collect call or want to bill the call to a third party, you dial zero in front of the number. That makes the call go through with an operator on the line who handles the billing details. But what happens if you dial zero in front of one of these office codes that the directory says there is no charge for? Well, from a crossbar 5, like my parents' line is served by, the call just goes through normally with no operator. But from my crossbar 1 line, it's a little more complicated. Here's dialing 0 in front of a 391 number. That was a ring and a click associated with 391 intercept at a very low volume. I'll turn up the volume. There she is, barely audible. And now... I'm sorry, your call did not go through. Will you please hang up and try again? This is a recording. 5167. I'm sorry, your call did not go through. Will you please hang up and try again? This is a recording. 5167. You know, now that I'm hearing more of that New York telephone standard voice, I'm starting to like it. Now I think it sounds kind of cool. And again, from my phone line, it's always 5167 on any local call, never 5166. So 391 did not look promising. Let's check and see if there are any office codes that end in zero in Nassau County. The office codes that end in zero in New York City tend to have sub-exchanges. And by the way, that's just what I call them. I don't know what they're officially called by the phone company. Now checking the list of Nassau County office codes... The first one that ends in zero is 420. Let's try dialing a 420 number. The number you have reached, 420. 3030 is not in service. Please check the number and dial again. 420 3030 is not in service. If you need assistance, you may stay on the line and an operator will answer. Well, what do you know? 
That system for handling vacant numbers in December 1970 is very hard to find. There are only a few Long Island office codes that even have it, and I'm surprised that 420 is one of them, because the ones that have it tend to be in Hempstead, and 420 is listed as Farmingdale. Well, I'll dial a few 420 numbers and let you know what I find. Okay, 420 would be a good office code to use if you want to hear any last four digits spoken by that system, because almost every number in 420 goes to it. But the twos are an exception. Here's a 4202 number. You have reached the intercept tape at the State University of Farmingdale. The number you have dialed has been temporarily disconnected. For additional information, please call 420-2000. Thank you. Hmm, a recording for a specific organization. A line noise that sounds kind of alive. The recording played once and stopped. I'm going to put the phone up to the radio and then call a nearby non-working number on my parents' line and see if we can hear the radio through this. Now on the second line, the recording played once and stopped. And we don't hear anything from that other line, even though the radio is playing over there. So apparently there's no connection. What needs to be tried next is calling in on both lines almost simultaneously. That way they should both get the recording at the same time, and maybe we can talk through that. I'll let you hear what happens on the second line. Well, what do you know? Only one line can get the recording at a time. Once the recording stops on one line, another line can get it, but two lines will never be hearing the recording at the same time. Meanwhile, the silence at the end of the recording doesn't connect to anything. So you know what this is? It's a perfect setup to make sure the non-working numbers don't ever become a so-called party line. Well done, phone company. Now, you know what I think this is? I think this is a sub-exchange, but a newfangled, electronic type. Considering the way so-called party lines have been deliberately made impossible, and the ring and busy tone are this. Yeah, I think this is a modern electronic sub-exchange of some sort. So it's interesting, it just won't ever be a party line. 420 is actually one of the new office codes that appeared in the most recent directory that we got in September. It wasn't in the previous one, so this is new. And it seems like the school in Farmingdale is the only thing in 420 right now. So let's move on to another code, 560. I'll dial a 560-32 number. Now this is more like it. It's a typical sub-exchange type ring.
I'll dial around a bit and see if I can find a recording. Okay, so far every 56031 number that I've tried does this. Took a while there for it to get up to speed. Okay, I'm gonna to go to my parents' line, dial a different 56031 number, and try to talk to you. You have reached a non-working number in Hofstra University. Please hang up and dial again. Oops, had to stop the tape. I'm not getting through over there. I'll show you what's happening from the second line. All of the 56031 numbers are doing this. This means that only one caller can get that recording at a time, dialing any 56031 number. But there might be another way into that recording. I'm going to stop the tape and dial around. Okay, there is another way in. You have reached a non-working number. As you can see, my line is still on the recording. I got it by dialing a 56031 number. And while I'm on this, nobody else can get in on 56031. But at least one other person can get in on any 5606 number. I just tried it on the other line while this was still up and I got through. So I'm going to have both Dave and me dialing a 5606 number. He'll dial 6000, I'll dial 6222. We'll try to both get on in addition to this line that has the tape recorder. At least one of us will get through. So Dave is going to call in, and I'm going to go to my parents' line and try to call in at the same time. guys doing okay? In this business, there's a lot of time spent sitting on the line with a recording playing over and over. Hopefully that's not driving you crazy, as it probably should have driven us but somehow never did. Anyway, believe it or not, Hofstra has one more recording. Now the recording we've been hearing is used for the vacant thousand group, the sixes, and the vacant hundred groups, three one, and I think if I recall correctly some of the fives, maybe there were no five six oh five nines. You could get one person on a vacant thousand group, you could get one person on a vacant hundred group, and they could talk through the recording, but that was it. So there was no real multi-person conference potential there. But the working groups, the 56032s, all of the 4s, and most of the 5s, had a different recording for their non-working numbers. And that recording could get multiple callers, because it was one caller per vacant number. If you called in the daytime, you would hear a lot of activity. There would be people dialing into vacant numbers by accident because they were on campus and forgot to dial 9 to make an outside call. 
some of the calls that rang into the line would make a busy signal noise on the line just because the ring supply had busy signal mixed into it. But there were also busy signals that would come onto the line for no apparent reason. You would also hear people talking to each other, and how that got onto the vacant number line, I don't know. Here's a sample of the 560 vacant number recording during the daytime. Many of those voices during the daytime were pretty loud, which made me think this had party line potential. So that evening, Dave and I tried talking through the Hofstra vacant number line. This is how it sounded. Daytime voices were louder because they were all on campus. But if we used this as a party line, it wouldn't be especially good. 560 was the last office code in Nassau County that ends in zero. So now I'm going to look at office codes that don't end in zero, but I'm going to skip the ones that have exchange names like Ivanhoe. In New York City, sub-exchanges don't turn up in those. They turn up in office codes that don't have letters. One of those here is 542. Most 542 numbers do this. The number you have dialed is not a working number. Please check your directory for the correct number. Thank you. The number you have dialed is not a working number. Please check your directory for the correct number. Thank you. Let's go to the other line and dial a different number, see if we can get through. The number you have dialed is not a working number. Looks like only one call can get on that recording at a time. I could look into 542 some more, but I think I want to move on. Oh, here's one. LR5. No exchange name there, just nonsense letters. Around 1967, they went through a phase of putting in nonsense letters on their way to phasing letters out altogether. LR5 is fairly new, although not as new as others. Maybe it's got a sub exchange.
Operator. Extensions beginning with the number 8 cannot be reached from outside Grumman. If your call is from outside Grumman, information may be obtained by dialing LR5-0574. Thank you. 575-0574? Really? This is a recorded announcement. For information on interplanned calls, dial 3369 for zero for operator. Hold up a second. Did it just say dial 3, 3, 6, 9, or as an alternative, zero? That's one hell of a tough decision. I don't know, man. Extensions beginning with the number 8 cannot be reached from outside Grumman. If your call is from outside Grumman, information may be obtained by dialing LR5-0574. Thank you. Well, this one, too, turned out to be busy on the second line. This is a recorded announcement. 299 is one of those office codes that makes the clicky noises no matter what number you dial. Here's a call to it from Eastern Queens. You have reached a non-working number at CW Post College. If you are calling from the outside, you can reach our attendant by dialing 516 299-0200. If you are inside, please consult your directory or dial zero for your attendant. This is a recording. You have reached a non-working number at CW Post College. CW Post College turned out to be a double disappointment. It has two recordings, one for the vacant number groups, like the nines and the eights, the other for individual non-working numbers within the good groups like the twos and the threes. Well, you could only get one call on a recording. If you called any of the individual vacant numbers within a good group, all the others would be busy. From the outside, you can reach our attendant by dialing 516. 516. What was I thinking? Are there sub-exchanges in Long Island? Yes. Are they usable as party lines? Not so far, and I'm about to call it a day when... Wait a second. The music just did something. That means something's about to happen. I actually had a dream like that when I was a young child. I was out on the sidewalk with some people, and suddenly there was a snippet of production music, and I went, Hey, the music just did something. Something must have happened. And you know, that is exactly what happened in real life in December 1970. Suddenly, out of nowhere, music started... Okay, that... I'm telling a story. But it was someone telling me a story that indirectly led to my finding what I was looking for here. A friend of mine, who I won't name, made up a vicious story that he told me as if it were the truth. He said there was a repairman at his home that had called up a computer-like device on the line. My friend said he had overheard the repairman using it and that it gave a lot of information. It said the phone number he was calling from mentioned that it had crossbar one circuitry and said a few other things. Well, that was a complete and total fabrication on my friend's part. I don't know why he wanted to tell me that story. And part of the lie he told was that the repairman had dialed a multi-digit phone number, very, very long, and that some of the digits in that long phone number were 222. Well, the 222 in this tall tale reminded me of something. Back in September, when the new directory had come out, I had compared the list of office codes in the new directory to the list in the old directory, and any office code that was new, I made note of. 222 was one of those new codes. So I called 222, but everything I tried did this. The number you have reached is not in service. Please check the number and dial again. The number you have reached is not in service. If you need assistance, you may stay on the line, and an operator will answer. Well, I know that system. Why isn't it saying the number? I couldn't help but wonder. But beyond that, I didn't explore it thoroughly. I'm going to go back and take another look at 222. 
Rather than being empty, it might be mostly empty with just one business customer who has a sub-exchange. 420 is like that. So I'll check and let you know. I don't know how I missed this, except that perhaps back in September it wasn't there. But now there is a sub-exchange in the 3000 group. Here's what it sounds like. Oops, and there is a vacant number recording. The number you have reached is a non-working number. Please dial 222-3000 for assistance. Thank you. The number you have reached is a non-working number. Please dial 222-3000 for assistance. Thank you. The number you have reached Hello. is a non-working number. Please dial 222-3000 for assistance. Not bad. Thank you. I think this would be really good to put 311 people on. The number you have reached is a non-working number. You can almost Please talk through the recording. You have to speak up a little bit. 3000 for assistance. But for shouting numbers, Thank it'll work you. great. Anyway, I'm going to hang up. The number you have reached is a non-working number. Please dial 222-3000 for assistance. Thank you. This was it. So I immediately checked all the numbers and began blasting them out over the old 311 recording. And in one day, we had an active, dynamic party line up and running. The people from 311 had a place to go, and I finally had something I could call my own. I created this. But I didn't record the 222 conference in use. No one did. Only the original intercept recording remains. So I can't show you what it was like, nor can I simulate it, because I don't have recordings of people using a conference line the way this one was used. So now, with 222 established, I could go back to talking to friends, and one of the people I was talking to was the wizard. The wizard told me about a sleuthing technique that he and Fred's gang had been using in order to find out someone's name and address when the only information you had was the phone number. It was actually quite clever. Now, if you had someone's phone number but no further information, the trick was to call their telephone company business office and give that number as the number you were calling in reference to. The representative would put you on hold, literally get up and get the file. Then when she came back, the first thing she said was, Mr. whatever the name is, and you'd say yes, so you could get the name just by calling in with the phone number. It was fairly easy from that point to ask innocuous questions like, what address are you sending my bills to? So with just a phone number and a call to the telephone company business office, you could get anyone's address even if he had an unlisted phone number. Now knowing that Fred and Felix could get my address from my phone number, I was then able to piece together what Felix did that day that so confused me. And no, Felix did not have to work for the phone company to do this. He did need a piece of phone company equipment, however, which I'm sure they would not have thought twice about stealing from a van, which was pretty easy to do in those days. So what exactly was this little caper? Let's start at the beginning. Now when Fred let me know that he had my number, there was only one more time that I called in and made any kind of a sound. That one event triggered Fred to give out my number to everyone. From that point on, I never made a sound on their lines ever again. Nonetheless, it soon became fashionable to start calling anyone who jammed the line by holding the phone up to the radio, Evan. I became the scapegoat du jour. Now, if I were going to test a potential party line for talkability, I would put the phone up to the radio. But for jamming the line to block conversation and piss everybody off, 
Oh, please, don't underestimate my pseudo-creativity as a 13-year-old. I didn't just have ID loops. I also had these. Audio signature, J3. The J stands for Jammer. I had a bunch of these things already made up in advance just in case I did want to jam up a line. I've mentioned this before, but let me give you a little medley of the sounds I would have used had I been the guy making noise on the line. Starting with... Audio signature, J2. Some people just don't get me. And these guys certainly didn't. It's funny how in some ways they were very good detectives, and in other ways... not so much. Probably their biggest fundamental error was thinking they could tell what's going on by dialing my number when someone was playing music on the line. The theory being, if I'm on the phone, I'm probably doing it. Aha! See? Evan is on the phone. You think? Now, based on my observations, which included calling into the line, hearing someone play music, to which people responded, Evan, you'd better cut that out, I'd guess this delusion went on unquestioned for about a week. But then, more and more instances began to occur when someone was playing the radio on the phone, but my line was not busy. Sooner or later, I had to be off the phone when they called, though that was still a rare occasion. And so the theory that it was me was beginning to break down. Some people started to call it right, but after a week of my phone being busy virtually all the time, the narrative had been so well established that many people were still invested in it. And so another theory was required. By some means, Evan is managing to play music on the line when his phone is not busy. How could that be? Aha! He probably has a second phone line! We're going to have to find out. And at that point, Fred and Felix got in their car and drove to Malvern, right to my house. Inside joke, if you watch the Get Smart intro, Max does appear to be using a ringback circuit. But anyway, here's where Fred and Felix really did get smart. Because you can tell how many phone lines someone has by just looking at the side of their home. Each telephone line in a suburban area runs from the telephone pole to the house and then down the side of one wall using a thick, flat black cable called a drop wire. By just looking at the side of my house, they could immediately tell that I had two phone lines. But they could do something more because they had at some point acquired what's called a lineman's test set. This is a little portable telephone that repairmen use. It has a dial built into the handset, and the wires terminate on two very special alligator clips. These clips are long and complex, and they have various appendages on them that makes it possible to connect to terminals or even tap into wires. The lineman's test sets have what is called a bed of nails on each clip, and a repairman can position them on a drop wire, press them in, and those tiny little nails will go through the insulation and make contact with the wire inside. 
Thus Felix was able to walk up to the side of my house and literally tap my line. With a test set, you can press the button in to go off hook and make a call, or leave it out, in which case it becomes a monitor device so that you can hear what's happening on the line without interfering. So as long as Felix was standing there next to my house, tapped in like that, he could listen to whatever I was doing. Now it was pretty easy to cause an apparent problem with my line by simply going off hook when I was trying to dial a number. With a rotary dial phone, you can't dial a number if there's another phone off the hook. So twice in a row, Felix went off hook on his test set while I was trying to dial. That created the apparent trouble, which triggered me to call repair while Felix listened in. That is how he knew I had called repair service. At that point, all he had to do was disconnect his test set, walk back to the car and drive home. Then once home, call back impersonating repair, asking me for my other phone number in the process. And at that point, Felix and Fred had all the information they needed. All that was left was to call back one more time and give me that warning to stop doing what I hadn't been doing. Mission accomplished. Sort of. Because whoever was really playing the music no doubt kept doing it. But it was a clever little caper nonetheless. And no use in saying There ain't no Santa Claus Christmas Eve Day, 1970, was spent with Neil. His family was Jewish and didn't celebrate Christmas. Meanwhile, my family, though deeply spiritual, considered Christmas to be a hyper-commercialized flim-flam good only for the fact that children like it. So I was free to go and do what I wanted on Christmas Eve. And in fact, Neil and I were celebrating, not Christmas, but 222. The number you have reached is a non-working number. Please dial 222-3000 for assistance. Thank you. The line was pretty much as expected, except that people were much more conversational than I'd thought. Instead of shouting out phone numbers to go speak privately, they tended to speak up and converse through the recording. The line was in fairly heavy use, though it started to lighten up as the evening progressed. And it was on this day that something we had not expected happened. We were listening to the line with people talking through the recording, when all of a sudden, Thank you. Well, well. Everybody on the line was quite surprised. 222 had now become one of those clear lines. Like the one we first marveled at the first time we heard the Brownsville 78062 line. And now we had one in the Long Island 516 area. Had I known that the recording was subject to stopping like that, I might not have given this one out publicly. But now it was done, and so Merry Christmas, Long Islanders. Santa Claus is definitely here to stay. And so Neil and I and others on the 222 line continued to enjoy Christmas Eve until fairly late into the evening. I was staying at Neil's house that night, and when we finally did go to sleep, we were both very pleased with what had happened. On Christmas morning, the first thing we did was to call in to 222, where we heard a happy, familiar voice. It was a guy who was extremely pleased about the new line. He even had given it a great nickname. He was calling it Room 222, which was the name of a very popular comedy drama television series at the time about a high school. Who was this guy who so appreciated 222? Why, Fred Smith. Merry Christmas! To be continued next program. <music> Telephone recordings used here are from later times in the 1970s, but are as accurate as possible for the time depicted. Good enough to fool me. Short wave composites, however, are not technically accurate. For example, notice here how the fading doesn't affect the interval signal. <laughs> Oh, 
Ed will plead for pardon. I was going for a particular feel, not technical accuracy, in the shortwave composites. Other than the fact that I'm not sure Dave helped me in December 1970, though he certainly did later, the research process here is extremely accurate. I've never had a lineman's test set, so it may be that the other appendage that looks more like a claw is more useful for connecting to a drop line than the bed of nails, which might work for thinner wires. I never confirmed that Felix tapped my line, but I did confirm that Fred had been to my house. I think those two things happened at once. It is the most likely scenario, in my expert opinion. In any case, that is the only time that I ever experienced the can't break dial tone problem. As many of you know, I did receive a visit from New York Telephone Security Agent Tom Duffy in late 1971. But what hasn't been related is a story that Duffy himself told me later. He and his associate knew that they were going to visit the guy who calls himself the doorbell. And for whatever reason, perhaps to be more intimidating, they came to the back door, where the first thing they encountered was a sign that said, Bell broken, please knock. Duffy says he and his associate had a good laugh over that one. 